Get the credential you need to control the risk of Legionella and other waterborne pathogens in building water systems. Become an ASSC Certified Legionella Water Safety and Management Specialist so you can crash that Legionella party in your pipes. Guided by the world's expert Legionella party crasher, Dr. Janet Stout, Special Pathogens Laboratory, and IAPMO give you the first and only live virtual interactive ASSE approved certification training. In just three days, you get the knowledge you need to sit for the ASSE 12,080 exam. Our ASSE certified teaching team has already trained more than 400 professionals with one of the highest pass rates. Time is running out to register for the last class of 2022. This class will be October 3rd through 5th. Group discounts are available. To learn more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash special. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash special. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, the host of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And Nation, you caught us right in the middle of Legionella Awareness Month. Every year during the month of August, we make sure that you, the industrial water treater, have all the information that you need so you can help your clients make better decisions when it comes to Legionella bacteria. And what we are going to do today, I think is going to revolutionize how you think about Legionella and how it can affect your company. The guest I have today is Russell Baskin, good friend of mine. And Russ changed his business overnight. And it was because of ASHRAE 188. It was because of the thing that we thought would never happen actually happened. And for Russ, it happened pretty quickly, and he's been dealing with it for years where a lot of us have refused to even learn about the topic. Now, I'm sure that's not you. I'm sure that's somebody else. But by any chance, if somebody out there is listening and you don't know what you need to know about educating your clients about Legionella and what your company should be doing and saying to your clients about Legionella, I hope you use this Legionella Awareness Month to start learning what you need to say, to start gathering resources so you can help your clients make better decisions. That's what this month is all about. And if I've done my job right, if my staff have done their job right, we are getting the water treatment community talking to their customers about something they should have already been talking about. Well, this is episode 265. Who can believe that we are so far through the year? But since we main mention of the calendar, let's go ahead and talk about some things that are coming up. Of course, one of my favorite things, the 2022 Association of Water Technologies annual convention is right around the corner, September 21st through 24th in Vancouver, Canada, I will be there. So many of my friends will be there. I hope to see you there. And the only way you can go there is to register. Now, we made it really easy for you to register. You can go to our show notes page, scalinguph2o.com, and go to today's show. Or you can go over to our events calendar and simply click on the links and they will take you to the registration page and it will also put in a calendar invitation so you can block off the time so you can go to this valuable conference. Now, if you are a business owner, come the day before because there's an, an entire day dedicated to business owners and how can we do better practices to make our businesses more healthy. Jill Cavano, friend of show, owner of Scranton Associates, she heads up that committee and she's a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. So we have an inside look at all the things that she's been planning with her team for this business owners conference. And I'm here to tell you that you do not want to miss this if you own a water treatment company. You will be sorry that you did, and I think people that do will get a leg up because 
successful people are sharing with other successful people how they became successful and what they can do to become even more successful. How would you not want to attend that? For all the information on the Business Owners Conference, go to our show notes page and we'll have everything linked for you there. The Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies is having their conference September 11th through 14th in Portland, Oregon. So this is all about infrastructure issues and creating solutions to solve those problems. If this is something that interests you, go to our show notes page and we'll have all of that ready for you to devour and even register. Well, as I mentioned, today's guest is Russell Baskin of Tower Water. And Russ is just going to change the way that you think about Legionella and your company. I cannot wait for you to hear this interview, but before we get there, let's do a little thinking on water with James. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about writing field service reports. What should you really be writing in a field service report? Should you write all is good while also listing the issues found? How might a badly written field service report haunt you later? How may overly general statements cause later problems? How much detail is too much? Who actually reads your field service reports? Do you ensure all the proper parties are fully aware of any issues or actions needed to be taken on top of just emailing the report out? Does your report actually provide value each visit, or is it just a repeat of the last report that the customer finds no value in reading each time? If it's not written down, it didn't happen, and the field service report is high-profile proof of the value you bring when written, communicated, and shared properly. Take this week to think about your field service reports and how you can work to increase their value. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's Thinking on Water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. As always, thanks for helping us think, James. You're doing a lot for the water treatment industry, and we're getting better each week for your thoughts on water. Well, now here's our guest, Russell Baskin. I hope you enjoy the interview. My lab partner today is Russ Baskin of Tower Water, president and visionary of Tower Water, and who I am extremely lucky to call a good friend. Russ, welcome again to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Well, Trace, it's always great being here. Very excited to be here with you today. I'm excited too. And Russ, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. You are part of my think tank. Uh, You are one of the individuals when I said I was thinking about creating not only the podcast, but also the Rising Tide Mastermind. You said you need to do it. And we actually talked about that and what that looked like. And was that a separate business? And how would I manage all of that? So I want to thank you because both of those endeavors have just been so much fun. Well, you really took the ball and ran with it. I would love to take a lot of credit for it, but not going to happen. Um, you had great ideas. You always have great insight. Um, you, in turn, have helped me so much in my business and my life. Um, I wish you all the success in the world, and you deserve it. Well, you definitely helped with a lot of that success. And I remember it was at an AWT conference in Palm Springs, my wife and I had rented an Airbnb and we were at the dining room table right inside. There was a nice pool behind us. And I said, guys, I'm thinking about doing this mastermind. And everybody was like, well, what the heck is that? And I was like, well, it's this just with more people. And just the questions that you asked and uh, everybody else that was involved in that, I can't thank you enough because like I said, The Rising Tide Mastermind has been one of my favorite things that I've ever been a part of. And um, and thank you for being a part of it. We just came off of our live event 
And that was just spectacular. Um, and of course, I'm talking about uh, something that we're not talking about on the, on, the, on the list here today. But since you are in the mastermind, how would you describe the live event to the Scaling Up H2O listeners? So for me, I've been to a lot of these kind of events, um, looking for a lot of motivation, looking to further my personal growth. And it really met and exceeded all my expectations, really, Trace. I mean, you are an amazing speaker. You don't even appear to be well rehearsed. You just know it off the top of your head. You're always excited to watch. You're just anything that goes up on the screen instantly draws all our attention. And really, all the topics are very relevant. And when I see that, that is value. That's the best way I can describe it. I am not a guy that likes to waste a lot of time. Listen, I'll, I'll do anything with you personally and have a great time. But if I'm doing something for work, it's got to pay off. And I can honestly say that that was an action-packed two and a half day situation. And from the fun to the to the work, it was great. We did something called Whirly Ball. How would you describe that to somebody? Well, if anybody that knows me knows how competitive I am. To me, it was like ice hockey in a in a bumper car with a scoop. And <laughs> I love ice hockey. I love the five on five and I love cars and, you know, just being able to smash people and, and throw a ball into a hoop is just, it's just the best thing ever. I got some great pictures. I would love to turn one of my warehouses bays into uh, a whirly ball ball. tournament place. (laughs) That's fantastic. I loved it. it. It was a great time. I think that'd be awesome. I'm going to look at putting something in the back of our warehouse. Maybe we can have full-time Whirly Ball. And of course, the North Star team won the championship. So I'm actually having a trophy made and they will be able to keep it for the next year. They're going to bring it back to the next live event. And then your team, the Lighthouse, can go ahead and win it from them. They were a pretty athletic team out there. They were really good. Going to be a hard team to beat for sure. But uh, I love it. I love the Masterminds Cup. I think that's going to be great. Get a banner and we'll start putting banners up <laughs> in one, one year. I love it. I can see it. Well, well, Russ, I have totally deviated from our normal opening and all the things that I have on my notes. So let's get back to what we should be talking about. And we're going to talk about Legionella. We're going to talk about your experience with Legionella. We're going to talk about what you wish you knew before you got a FedEx letter and everything changed from there. But before we get there, the Scaling Up Nation wants to know a little bit more about Russ Baskin, CWT. So what can you tell them about yourself? What's important to me is really about being happy and healthy you know, great family, making sure that all my people are taken care of and make sure that I'm giving back for all the things that have been given to me over the years. That's really what motivates me. I love seeing people succeed in this business. I love seeing people succeed in life. I wanted to be the best father ever. And I think I'm doing a pretty good job at that as well. So I'm really here to give back. I'm here to help and I'm here to make the industry better. Russ, how long have you been in the water treatment industry? Uh, I started in the water treatment industry in 1988, so about 34 years. I feel like I'm one of the older guys in the group now. It's really strange. You know, I used to look up to the older guys, and I still do, but now I'm kind of in the same class as the older guys. It's, It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I was at the live event, and Sean McGrade, who's been on this podcast a couple of times, he compared me to the same age group as uh, Jay Farmery and Bruce Ketrick. How does that happen? <laughs> Probably the same way it happens for me. It's that you have experienced more in your age than, than most people have. You're willing to learn. You're willing to grow. You're willing to take chances. And when you do that, you gain this experience and this knowledge, not to put anybody else down, but when you share your knowledge, you're in that elite group. And that's why 
they put you in that same category. Well, you're in that same category too. And I think we got there because we made a lot of mistakes. Oh, absolutely. Russ, I'm curious, how did you go to own your own company? It pretty much happened. I'm not going to take it all the way back, but I worked for one of the major companies and I had a client ask me if I could clean their cooling tower. And if I can clean their cooling tower, I could have their water treatment. I said, okay, let me take a look at this thing. Went up there, decided, sure, I can do that. Priced the whole thing, even though my company doesn't do it. And uh, I had great friends that were worked on the outskirts of our industry, picked their brains, was able to do it, started cleaning cooling towers on weekends. And, you know, in the water treatment space, when companies start getting bought and sold, they kind of dilute the culture. And my company that I work for diluted the culture because they sold the company. At that time, I was number one, number two, number three within the company. And as soon as the, the new company bought us, everything went to paying on profit. And since I'm, I worked in New York City, profitability of my territory was one of the worst. And I went to literally 158. So the writing was on the wall. They didn't, they didn't want to pay us what we were worth. And they told me that I have to cease and desist what I'm doing or be let go. And it was pretty much right after the Gulf War and my wife wanted to have a baby. And I just noticed if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. And I always had that entrepreneurial spirit. And I took a leap of faith, started in one bedroom in my house with a phone on a desk. And I worked at the original company six years to the actual date that I started there. And never looked back, built the business one account at a time, one construction job at a time. And, you know, somehow we just made it. And I started a family a year and a half after that, moved the business out another year after that. And, you know, pretty much brought on one person a year after that and built the business. Well, it is amazing what you have built. I've, I've seen it. Uh, I've met a lot of your team not only have you employed a great team, but you've created an amazing culture. And I know that's something that you try to make sure that everybody embraces. How do you do that? How do you have a culture in your company that just leads everything else? Well, I guess it starts in where do you start the business, right? I wanted to have a place where people would want to come to and customers would want to be a part of. And those were the two founding principles that I started with. And in order to do that, you have to make the place fun. You have to make the place at least tolerable to come to work. And for me, all my friends seem to be the colleagues that I worked with. All work and no play makes Johnny a, a dull boy, right? So you have to make it fun. You have to make it interesting. You have to be learning constantly you have to give people what they want. And very early on, I'd be interviewing people and seeing what makes them tick. And this was way before the HR days. So everybody would get a little something that they wanted rather than, you know, everything collectively as a whole. And when you have employees or people, I like to call them peers rather than employees. When you have peers that you're willing to listen to and you're giving them a an easy place to make suggestions and you actually take their suggestions, that's what builds culture. When you have meetings and you invite everybody and take them outside the actual company, that builds culture. When you invite their families to a picnic and get to see them, that builds culture. And then furthering that as you get bigger, it gets harder and harder. If you hire people with the same values, you can really keep the culture going. And if your values are good values that most of the people have, they seem to fit and they seem to like each other and seem to want to help each other because they all feel like they're part of the same thing. 
I've been the recipient of several of the outings that you do to make sure that culture stays strong in your company. One, we went skydiving or indoor skydiving, and that was incredible. And then I got the pleasure of doing some training at your offices. And then on the tail end of that, you had a quarterly meeting and you had a party right outside of your office. And that was just amazing. Everybody came, several of the spouses showed up after they got off from work and everybody was just enjoying each other. And I just remember thinking, this is a healthy team. Yeah, well, you can always get 90% of your team. Let's let's be real about it. But yeah, those are the kind of things that make the difference. And, um, you know, truly getting personal with your team makes the makes a world of difference. And, you know, giving them what they appreciate makes the world of difference. It's really funny. Early on, I, I wanted to give them a Christmas party, bring your spouse, do all this. And they sat me down. And they told me, this is not what we want. We want a summer picnic where we bring our families, go swimming, play softball, do this, do that. Perfect. Even though it may not be exactly what I would want to do, but if it's what they want to do, they're going to enjoy it. And then I will, you know, enjoy watching them enjoy it. So that really gives the, that's the give back to me at the end of the day. Russ, I'm thinking back to, we've known each other for a while, but the first real conversation that we had, it was at an AWT. I think it was in San Francisco when we were having a training there and you and I were sitting beside each other. We just struck up a conversation and we noticed we were using the same language from a book that we were reading called Traction. And you and I just just bonded over the entrepreneurial operating system. Was that about 10 years ago? Yeah, we started it in 2012. So yeah, we were fresh and new in, when we went through that. And yeah, I remember that conversation. I think we did talk before there, but maybe not as much about business. And all of a sudden, we had that instant bond and, you know, throwing ideas back and forth. Of course, you know, you're a deep thinker. I'm a deep thinker. And, uh, you know, we're, we're always rushing to get to that end point as quickly as we can. So, yeah, I do recall that. And it's, it's very alive and well today. And it's helped us through a lot of tremendous breakthroughs within our company as well. I remember when we were talking about it, I thought I was the only water treatment company that was running on the entrepreneur operating system. I'm sure you felt that way. Of course, we've met probably a dozen other people that are also running a water treatment company on EOS. I don't know. It, it kind of changes everything. It makes things a little bit easier. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can, you can be a great water treater and not have to worry about, okay, how do I put all these things together for business? I just plug it into here and make sure I'm staying on top of things, make sure I'm doing all the checkups, and it really does make things easier. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, once you get through it. I'll tell you a really quick, quick story is that what we were going through right before we started EOS, I was at a point where I was actually making a violations list for my people and saying, this is a, a level one violation, a level two violation, a level three violation. You know, if you get two level one violations, uh, you're going to be on probation to be let go. And it felt terrible. I told you, I built a company that I wanted people to come to come and work for and have fun with. Right. And it turned out that we were not hiring people by values. We were hiring people by their skills. And yes, they were great people. They were great at doing what they were doing, but they just didn't fit in. And, you know, all you have to do is let a couple of those people go. We have never had a violations list since. Not saying we haven't had people that violate what we do, but they're handled on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, you know, if it's time for them to go, it's time for them to go. We hire, fire, and promote based on our values all the time, which is the EOS way. When we first started EOS, we also had some people that weren't doing the things that we said that we were supposed to do. And it was maybe about a month and both of them left the company voluntarily. 
It just happens. They didn't fit in anymore, and there wasn't any place for them to not get in line with what we said our values were. Did you have a similar situation? Yes, we did. We had we had the same thing go on. And it was the funny part about EOS is that you cannot escape these values. So what you don't realize is the rest of the company is running on them as well. So if somebody violates them, it's not only you that notices, it's the rest of the company that notices. And if if they're they will actually have the conversation before you do to that they better get in line. And if they don't, you're gonna know pretty quickly that they don't fit in, unfortunately, or fortunately. But it really it really erodes your culture when you have people that you, you can't make up your values. You're kind of born with them. We gave people plenty of time to get to get on board with them when we started. But at the end of the day, if they're not your values, it's gonna be very hard. And, and I know this sounds incredibly horrible. We're talking about people that that left uh, our team, but it actually worked out really well. The two people that I'm referring to, they've got jobs they enjoy even better than working here. And now we're not trying to push string uphill, if if you will. Our team functions a lot better because now we found people that do want to live our core values. Everybody's happier. I can't agree more. You know, it's it's funny is that, I've cried, literally cried when people have left my company because I love them as a person so much, but they're just horrible for my team because of their values. And they've gotten they've gotten great jobs and they were still friends today, but you know, I uh, I would never have them back into my company. Well, Russ, it sounds like everything's going well. You guys learned EOS, you started running on EOS. Tower Water is at the top of its game, and then one day you got a delivery from FedEx. You opened the letter. What did that letter tell you? I remember this day like it was yesterday, to be honest with you. Just to make it a little more clear, it was a Friday afternoon in August. I'm prepping to go down the shore. My team is all, you know, all giddy and ready to, ready to get out the door. And, you know, the FedEx comes and you're like, oh, what can this mean? An insurance thing, uh, you know, a customer wants to leave you, something like this. But no, I opened this FedEx and it's literally an order from the commissioner of New York City saying that I have to clean and disinfect every cooling tower that I, that I service within the next 14 days. I have to give a spreadsheet of every cooling tower and all the data from it in five days. And literally in five days, I have to turn over all the water treatment reports, any reports I've done for these cooling towers for the last year. And again, it went from Friday, August 7th to Friday the 13th overnight. In that minute, my jaw dropped, panic set in. I was, I was out of my mind. I Got on the phone, called 911 to my lawyer. You know, is this legal? Can they do this? I was in full blown panic mode at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon in the summer. I'm guessing you didn't make it to the Jersey Shore. No. Uh, knowing me, Trace, I think I can solve any problem in about 15 minutes. And I went into full blown emergency mode, to be honest with you. And I, you know, just basically called my wife. I had almost the same conversation I had on 9-11. I said, uh, I'm not coming home anytime soon. And don't worry, I'm not in the area, basically. It was, it was you know, devastating to me. I needed to figure this out and I was going to stay at work until I figured out what we were going to do, how we were going to handle this, what the clients are going to think, how are we going to get this done? So let's paint the picture a little bit more for the Scaling Up Nation. The first edition of ASHRAE 188 was released, and then almost exactly one month later, there was an outbreak in New York, and this is how the legislation decided that they were going to correct this from happening again. Exactly. Just to put it a little bit more clear, They followed a protocol from 1989 that happened in Quebec City, Canada. So they 
had the same kind of order, 14 days to clean and disinfect all cooling towers. The differences between Quebec, Canada, and New York City is only about 9,910 cooling towers, right? So there's 90 cooling towers in Quebec City. There's about 10,000 in New York City. So even though there's a tremendous amount of water treatment companies, there's still not enough people to get that job done. Yeah, let's face it. The people that voted on that, they had no idea what a cooling tower was. They had no idea what Legionella was. They heard that people were getting hurt, people were getting sick, and they needed to do something about it. Correct. And it was a knee-jerk reaction. They followed a protocol that was literally 25 years old, 30 years old. So what did that weekend look like? You got your team together. You now have these mandates that you, I mean, how the heck are you going to do that in three days and 14 days? How'd you do it? Well, I felt like we were actually going into battle. The truth of the matter, I called all my lieutenants in. I said, how are we going to do this? Got the whiteboard out. Love that whiteboard with all my colors and go around and literally plan this whole thing out. We navigated the whole thing out, what we were going to do, how can we get, listen, I had over 300 cooling towers at the time that I had to, that I had to get serviced. We had to write everybody a proposal. We had to get it out because we can't write checks out of our customers' checkbooks. So literally I was like the general and my lieutenants were underneath me and they were with me. Unfortunately for them, I can work 80 hours straight and they cannot. So the big biggest thing about that is, thank God I have some cooler heads on my team that can, you know, are a different temperament than me that can straighten me out. And, you know, that's, that's really, really, really important that, you know, you're not all the same person on the team or we would have just went crazy. You, Russ, you mentioned temperaments. We've mentioned temperaments all the time here on the podcast. Something I will share with the Scaling Up Nation, I've let the nation know that I am a, a dark red. You are just as dark red as I am. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do have a streak of blue and a streak of yellow, <laughs> but I am the guy you want to sit next to if you're having a problem, for sure. And I've had many instances of that. It's so funny because my wife and I are both Reds and we've seen people go down at events. She goes to the head, I go to the feet and we go to work like we're on EMT team (laughs) (laughs) and neither one of us are, but we're willing, we're willing to step in always. So Russ, that was the premise of how you just set up what was going on when you got that letter. And that's how you opened up your presentation to the Association of Water Technologies. That was in Orlando. That was what, five years ago, something like that? Yeah, it was 2018, I believe. And I remember you just had everybody in that room, their eyes were wide open, their jaws were dropped, people were taking notes, and you're going to tell us some things that you had to do and things you wish you did so you didn't have to react so quickly. And so many people in that room got the information, and I can tell you for a fact, they haven't done anything with it. And it is coming sooner or later, and it might even be there, and you don't know that it's there. So Nation, if you are not tuned in and listening, listen to Russ. This changed his company. If he knew the information that he is getting ready to share with us right now, it would have made everything different. It would have actually allowed him to go home and sleep in his own bed over that week. So... Stay buckled up because Russ is going to be telling us some things that are just stuff that we need to do or we're going to wish that we had it. 100%. And I will tell you, that was my most glorious presentation that you were supposed to help me with, if you don't recall. Your name was on it. (laughs) All right, all right. You and Mr. Lewis. But it was so funny that when right before this started, there was literally 10 people in the room if you recall. And I was like, you guys better move forward because there's no reason for me to scream all the way up. You know, it's the room was a huge room. And then all the other sessions let out. And all of a sudden I'm sitting in a room with literally 700 to a thousand people. And it was like, 
Well, well, hold on. You were speaking, so you didn't know what was going on. The 10 people that were in the room were texting, oh my gosh, you need to be in here. We need to hear this. And a couple of people trickled in and then other people. So I, I'm i not 100% sure that the sessions let out. I think that people chose to leave the sessions that they were in and come listen to you. I really think that's what happened. I'm a very modest person, so I, I don't assume that it was all that great. Well, it was great because, hey, this can close you down. This can mean that you don't have a business anymore. 100%. Not to say you aren't an amazing speaker, because you are, but the material was, oh my gosh, this is some scary stuff. It was. 100%. In all seriousness, this was my defining moment in my company, no doubt. So with all of that, I think everybody's listening in now. So hopefully we can get the message across because if you knew what you're getting ready to tell people to do, your life would have been a lot simpler. Let's face it, you still have a lot to do, but you would have been so far along, you wouldn't have to start where you did. So what is something you wish you knew, you wish you did before you got that letter? Well, for me, the AWT was talking about this ASHRAE 188 for probably almost 10 years before this law ever came out. It was going through revisions. They, you know, they showed you all the rigmarole and all that, all the process which ASHRAE goes through to put something like this together. And, you know, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I heard about it, but I was like, "Ah, I'll wait till it's out and then we'll start looking at it, even if it becomes anything, right? So I kept pushing it off, pushing it off. I did hear that it came out at the end of June and I said, okay, you know, the summertime's a good time. Everything's stable. We can start looking at it in the summer. And lo and behold, the summer came and so did the letter. And I'm like, oh my God. This is crazy. I, they, you know, AWT has told us this is coming. It's coming. It's coming. And now it's come to me and anybody else in New York, but nobody else. So Russ, I know Bill Pearson is a listener and he's a past president of the Association of Water Technologies. And he's also been the ASHRAE liaison for AWT for quite some time. He was a voting member on the document writing committee that created ASHRAE 188. And he was the one that made sure AWT was highly involved in writing that document. And it used to be we had a general session in AWT and all the liaisons gave their report. And that's what you're referring to. I'm not sure when, but somewhere that stopped and we no longer get that information. So I'm not sure where that's disseminated to the membership. But if anybody on the AWT board is listening, Russ learned about this through that general session. So I urge you to bring those liaison reports back because if we don't know what's going on in our industry, we can't react fast enough or properly. Well, I know at the training, at the um, the twice a year training, now there is a Legionella portion of that training and there's definitely updates in there, but I don't know where else to get it from either. It's not like there's a a wheel on the AWT website under Legionella regs, right? Yeah. There's so many other regulations that could affect us from all these other trade organizations. So AWT does a great job of pointing the liaisons and the liaisons do a great job of reporting back to AWT, but it's just been harder and harder for the member to get that information. I'm sure it's out there. I just don't know where it is. I agree. You know, when you look for anything, you kind of find it, but if you're not looking and you're not you know, being aware, you might have to look really hard to find it. Yeah. And I'm sure there's somebody on the board that's screaming at their stereo saying, Trace, it's right there. I, I just don't know where it is. And it used to be very easy because I would show up to a meeting and you would spoon feed it to me. And it's just not being spoon fed anymore. Well, Nation, as you can tell, we've got a lot more to discuss with Russ Baskin, and I know you cannot wait to hear it, but you're going to have to wait because we're going to continue this interview next Friday 
In the meantime, I hope you start learning about Legionella. I hope you start taking some of the things that we've talked about over these last few weeks and turn them into the regular dialogue that you have with your customers. And I hope you tune in for the exciting conclusion of our interview with Russ Baskin. Have a great week, folks. Nation, it's hard to improve the day-to-day when we are stuck living in the day-to-day. And for one hour a week, you can join the group at the Rising Tide Mastermind so you can work on the business without being in the business. That one hour will change every other hour of the week. It's magic. It's not magic. It's how we get together, it's how we process issues, it's how we encourage each other, and it's how we just form these common bonds around each other, and there's a camaraderie that I promise you will not find anywhere else. To find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.